Hey, to my Macedonia family and to all those who might be watching, this is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome back to Macedonia Virtual Sanctuary. I'm so glad you decided to join us today. First, I want to thank uh, Brother Eugene Chapman for blessing us and reminding us of how great God is. And one of the reasons why God is so great is that God created us and the method by which God created us was through a womb of a woman and we call them mother. And so I want to take this opportunity to wish every mother and mother figure out there happy Mother's Day. Ain't nobody like mama and so we are honored and grateful to have you in our lives and mother is different than child bear and so those uh, are some some people and some women in our lives who have been surrogate mothers and who fill that void and responsibility of mother and so we honor all of you all today I want to give you one more announcement our uh, just us food pantry ministry will be back uh, at Macedonia on this coming Wednesday, May 12th, from 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. For those in the community or our members who uh, need food or would like some food, we have that here available. Again, that's this Wednesday, May 12th, uh, from 9 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. And you may enter through the West Lafayette entrance of the building. The devil's been busy this past week, and so let's begin with a word of prayer as we break the bread of life. Spirit of the living God, we come now knowing how great you are. And so God, we ask that your greatness will show up in this moment. We bind any spirits that will come up against your people in this time of proclamation. Center us, O oh God. Make holy ground wherever we sit or stand. Bring our spirits, bring our intellects into the realm of your sanctuary that we might hear what thus saith the Lord. Hide me behind your cross. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight our Lord and our Redeemer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Beloved, we are finishing our Holy Ground series this week. We have been on a spiritual uh, journey to wrestle with this notion of Holy Ground. Uh, we have dealt with the access, we've dealt with the the temple that is our body. We have dealt with decorum. We have dealt with all aspects of holy ground. And God uh, wanted uh, me and I believe challenged me to uh, conclude this message, uh, these series of messages and teaching um, in a particular frame of mindset. And so in light of where we are, as our church begins and our church leaders um, at this point, begin to discern about our reopening strategy and as other uh, communities of faith and as other institutions in our society begin to reopen or have reopening conversations I believe it's, it's best for us to end uh, with a particular context in mind so if you have your Bibles I want you to go with me to the book of Ezra Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament, the Torah. It is in Ezra chapter 3 and a little bit of chapter 4 that will arrest our attention for this morning. I want to begin at verse 10 and continue forward. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Esaph, 
with cymbals according to the directions of King David of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of families, old people who had seen the first house on its foundation, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house. Though many others shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard far away. When the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel, and the heads of the families and said to them let us build with you for we worship your God as you do and we have been sacrificing to him ever since the days of King Esar Hayden of Assyria who brought us here but Zerubbabel Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the families in Israel said to them, You shall have no part with us in building a house of our God. But we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus of Persia had commanded us. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. And they, buried, uh, they bribed officials to frustrate their plan throughout the reign of King Cyrus of Persia until the reign of King Darius of Persia. The word of God is blessed. Beloved, I want to use for a topic to conclude our Holy Ground series, Holy Reset. Holy Reset. One day this past week, a thunderstorm in the middle of the night raged in the county. And I was in my house minding my business. And because of that thunderstorm, my electricity went out for a brief moment of time. And in my house, I cut the cord so not only do I not have power, but my only sources of media entertainment comes through my internet. And so when I was able to receive power back into the house, I had to go down to my basement, and I had to reconnect and recalibrate my internet's modem in order that all of my devices could have reception to the modem in order for me to enjoy all of the media entertainment I have. I know I'm spoiled, I'm spoiled and I know I'm a millennial and so I need my Netflix, my Hulu and everything else in order for me to uh, feel comfortable. So I went downstairs and I had to literally reset my internet. I had to take the power from the modem and then reconnect it again. After I reconnected the power cord to the modem, I had to wait for the modem to start up. And as I waited for the modem to start up, I had to sit there and I was sitting there waiting to see the machine go through its internal process to reconnect. 
I had to reset in order to get back on track. Beloved, that is the context of our pericope in the book of Ezra. The same is true in these moments for Israel. At this particular time in Israel's history that's documented in the book of Ezra, the people of Israel have been in captivity to Babylon. The Assyrian Empire takes advantage of the division in Israel, the northern tribe of Judah and the southern tribe of Israel, where Jerusalem sits. And in the midst of that internal strife, Assyria comes in and lays waste to Israel. Decades have gone by. And a part of, Israel, a part of the ancient Near East customs of conquering is that they would take the best, some of the best and brightest of a conquered people and force them to migrate from their homeland and exile themselves to the capital city of the conqueror empire. And so people and prophets that we know like Daniel were forced to leave Israel and to go to the capital cities of Babylon. Well, at the time of our text, there is a new king and empire and administration on the block. By this particular time, the Persian Empire has conquered the Assyrian Empire. After years of oppression and exile, one of the decrees that the king of Persia makes is that the people of Israel can be allowed to leave where they have been exiled to and are allowed to go back home. They are allowed, after years of oppression, to go back and rebuild their temple. And they begin the process of resetting themselves again. Beloved, notice that reset happens in divine timing. Israel does not have the opportunity to even begin the conversation about restarting and resetting and recreating the temple until a new administration comes into fruition. And sometimes, beloved, no matter how much we desire for us to get back on track, you have to wait for the Lord's timing to allow certain things to take place in order for precedence to be set to move forward. Israel is not given permission to go back to Jerusalem until they move from the Assyrian Empire to the Persian Empire. And they begin the plans of constructing their temple. They organize in earlier verses of chapter 3, they organize and take count and take note of who is coming back. And then they make sure they have offering to, to build and have all the materials and bring all the artisans needed in order to begin the plans and the works of building the temple again. Solomon's temple, that great temple that they constructed in order for them to praise God, in order for them to have a specific location to honor and worship God. They want to rebuild their holy ground again. And we find in our pericope, in verse 10, they start laying the foundation of their temple. Every building has to have foundation in order to have stability. And they begin by building the foundation. But that is not what is so intriguing to me. What is intriguing to me is that 
they start praising and shouting for just laying the foundation stone. Some, some scholars suggest that they might have been having a ceremony where they took a piece of the foundation of the old temple as a beginning part to build their new temple. There's no record to say what the celebration is, but at the beginning of laying the foundation, they are already praising God. And beloved, I'll, I'll come by to tell you that when you're trying to attempt holy reset, that we have to relish in the process and not the project. The people of Israel don't have what I believe is an issue for so many of us right now. That, that we have become so consumed by being finish driven, completion driven, in story driven, victory laps. And so we only praise God, worship God, and notice when God does something when we've completed a task. But what Israel demonstrates to us is that you do not wait until the temple is built to give God praise. You don't wait and be satisfied with things after it's finished. But you ought to take every process and step and enjoy it and give God praise for where you are in your reset process. First of all, parenthetically, they have a process. And truth be told, some of us cannot make it further in our lives because we don't even have a plan. We don't even have a process. And they begin their process of mapping through and laying the foundation and they stop and pause and say, thank you, God. And we ought to take a moment in holy reset to just say, thank you, God, for the process that we're already in. That you should not just thank God for the degree, but you ought to thank God for the fact that you passed every class on your way to your degree. You shouldn't just thank God for the house, but you ought to thank God for the down payment. You ought to thank God for every mortgage payment that you ever met. That we ought to praise God and relish in our process, not just our projects. You ought to give God praise and say, thank you, God. Not just for getting a job, but every two weeks, every month, every week that you get a paycheck, it's another proof that God is still walking with us and still abiding in us. And God has not given up on us. Relish in your process. You will spend more time in process than in completion. You'll spend more time in the cocoon than you will ever be flying as a butterfly. Relish in the process. Beloved Israel, at the foundation, starts thanking God. I don't know what you're, where you are in your process. I don't know how you're trying to recalibrate your life after this season of pandemic and as we continue to plan, but you ought to thank God that you made it this far. Don't thank God just because you're fully vaccinated. You ought to thank God for every mask you wear. You ought to thank God for every shot you've had. You ought to thank God for every doctor appointment you've seen. Relish in the process. Israel relishes in the process. They don't wait until the temple is built to praise God, but they start thanking God and giving joy and peace and gladness and alms to God simply because the foundation has been laid. But notice, notice, notice what gets attention in the praise. They're shouting and they're praising, and the scripture says you, you, really, you really can't tell, but what, notice that there are two distinctive groups of people who are giving praise in this moment. Two demographics that draw our theological attention. The Bible says that there are older people. Those old people are the, the Levites, the priests, and the heads of families. Beloved, those old people are weeping in their shouting, which proves that you don't always need to praise God just with happy times, 
but you can praise God in your sorrows as well. That when you cry out to the Lord and lament that that is true and authentic praise and worship as well. And the elders are weeping. Scholars suggest that the elders are weeping because these are the persons who saw the first temple in Solomon's era built, they were forced to leave it and they come back and there's nothing there. They have seen and experienced what was before and now are coming to a place where there's nothing there. And scholars would suggest that there are two possible reasons for their weeping. The first is, is that it could have been that they had FOMO, that they had fear of missing out, that because of their age, they might not get a chance to see the completion of the temple built the second time. That because of where they are in their life stage, they might not get an opportunity to see the full majesty of the holy ground temple being built again. And this is where we see a distinction between individual resets and community resets. That you can rebuild your life as an individual, but there are some things you cannot reset without community. That just because you got your job back, and just because you are back in the office, doesn't mean that the church can come back yet. And so they have a fear of missing out. The second reason is that scholars suggest that it might not be fear, but they are weeping because the new temple don't look like the old temple. The new temple don't look like Solomon's glory. The new temple doesn't have the same splendor. And this ought to be a moment where we ought to be careful trying to glorify the past as if it is better than what is possible in our future. There's nothing wrong with honoring the past. And we should be there to verify and check and remember our history. But we should not be arrested by our history. And we should be a people that understand that God is an ever-present God, that God is eternal. There is no past. There is no present. Everything is momentary and present for God. And with God's vision, we don't glorify our past. We just honor it. And so the elders are weeping. But then there are praises of shouting, which suggests that then there is a younger generation. And the reason why the younger generation is shouting is that they have no reference for Solomon's temple. They grew up in exile. They didn't grow up in Jerusalem. They grew up in the hood. They didn't grow up in the church. And so when they come back to Jerusalem, they don't see a temple. They have no recollection or memory or generational consciousness of a temple. And so they are watching And all they see is a blank canvas. And they're shouting for joy because now for the first time in their generation, they get to be a part of building something. That they are excited, not about the past, but they are excited because they get to make history. And beloved, my point is this, that everybody's reset is going to defer. That based upon where you are in your life, based upon your struggles, based upon your circumstances, you should not be concerned about where somebody else is on their path of restarting where you are. You shouldn't compare your life to somebody else's because you don't know what perspective they're coming from. Somebody could be weeping and at the same time, somebody could be shouting for joy. Somebody could be weeping at the very thought of coming back into this church because they are more at risk than others when it comes to the pandemic. And so they're weeping because they don't know when they'll be able to come back. And others might be shouting for joy because they know they're gonna be the first ones in the house when we do open back up. 
But regardless of what side you're on, you ought to stay focused on trying to reset your process. To get yourself back into holy alignment, to get your life back on track when pandemic is over. Everyone's reset is going to look different. And so don't compare your reset to somebody else's. You don't know what it took them to get to this point. I might, might as well stop here and just be have a sidebar church meeting. Uh, don't compare other churches based upon what they're doing to what we're doing. We don't know what they have. They don't know what we have. Stay focused in your process. Stay focused in your prayer life that God would give us the resources and the ability to move forward with safety and security. Everyone's process is different. But in our resetting, beloved, not only should we relish in the process, and as we relish in our process, we should no longer compare our reset with others. But lastly, beloved, please don't neglect your help. If this pandemic has forced us to realize anything, is that we are not going to make it in this life without others. Community is needed. And everybody, somewhere along the line, is going to be in a position where you're going to need some help. Look at what Israel does in chapter 4 when help is offered to them. The Bible describes, and the writer of Ezra records the help, first of all, as adversaries. They already have a pessimistic, negative perspective of somebody who simply says, we want to help you rebuild. Well, first question you got to ask, and it's a fair question, well, why do you want to help? Well, remember in the last verse of chapter 3, it says that their praise and their shouting could be heard from far away. Maybe people want to help. Maybe people want to join because they're trying to find out where your joy came from. Maybe that because of how you're living your life and how you're rebuilding your life that they want a piece of what allows you to do that. And your excitement is so attractive, your zeal is so enthusiastic that they want to be a part of that same power and that same Jesus that is bringing you through your process. And so don't be alienating people or prideful of people who simply are offering help. They call them adversaries. And scholars suggest that these adversaries are really what we know as Samaritans. And there's a long negative and antagonistic history between Israel and the Samaritans. It's even found in the New Testament Gospels where traditionally people of Israel would have walked around the area known as Samaria. And scholars suggest that one of the reasons why there is such antagonism is because simply they're different. That the people of Israel are so consumed by their bloodline, they're so consumed by their family lineage, they're so, co so consumed by their orthodoxy that anybody that defers from what they desire or what they think is credible is excluded. And beloved, you will miss out on your blessing by excluding people simply because they're different from you. And the people of Israel end up turning a potential friend into a definite enemy. The Bible says that after they told those adversaries no, they gave them hell for the rest of their days. They fought them tooth and nail past every king that they've ever had. Why? Because you slapped the hand that was trying to offer you assistance. And beloved, when you are resetting, 
You ought to be careful not to dismiss angels that you don't know have come your way. God has sent me here to remind and tell some folk that in this season, as we rebuild, do not neglect hands that are trying to help you. Do not push away people who can assist you in ways to put your life back on track. And so it, by limiting their assistance, they limited their vision. And so instead of them building a nation and an empire, they only can build a temple because their adversaries stayed adversaries because we no longer desire and they no longer desire to seek their help. Well, beloved, let me tell you, like my uncle said one time, you can get a, a lot farther with honey than you ever can get with salt. And the people of Israel have an adversarial relationship with people in their community and people who are trying to join their community because they didn't think they were a part and that they were in. And I warn us, even as a community of faith, that when we do open back up and new faces begin to show, we ought to show love and compassion and joy and excitement about the fresh faces and the fresh spirits that have decided that what's happening here is so exciting that I got to join it. But Israel decides that it's going to push back. And I don't know about you, but that story sounds very familiar. In the future, Israel will seek another reset. They will find themselves under another empire. That Roman empire that still to this day remains in legend. And they will seek some help. They will desire a king and a messiah. They desire somebody that can make them strong and make them powerful and make them representative of the chosen vessels that they believed that they were. And God orchestrates a plan before the foundation of the world to bring them a Messiah, to bring their deliverance. And when he came to help, they rejected him. When he tried to teach them a better way, they said no. When he wouldn't play his part or so-called role, then they tried to get rid of him. And so they traded him in for a murderer, brought him in to Roman authority on trumped up charges. And there, they neglected their help. I, I like the way the Psalms puts it. The Psalm says, uh, the, the Psalm says that the stone that the builders rejected became the chief cornerstone. Beloved, I'm done. I just, I just want to, to re remind you that in Holy Reset, you and I have some assistance. That God is so gracious and God is so loving and God is so caring that even when Jesus was rejected, Jesus said that he, he wanted to go to prepare a better place. Jesus was rejected. And yet, he, when he got up, he still stuck around the people that alienated him for 50 more days. Jesus was rejected. But Jesus was still willing to offer love and compassion. And beloved, I just want to remind you on this last series of Holy Ground that you serve a God that sits at the right hand of the Father and is in a place and in a position to give you a reset. Every day you open up your eyes, God has given you another reset. Every time you make a mistake, God has given you another reset. 
every time you have problems and somehow you didn't know how you were going to get out of it but somehow God made ways out of no way reset every time you got to the doctor's office and God uh, gave you they gave you a report that was negative God gave you a reset and I don't know who's watching I don't know who's listening but you ought to thank God that Jesus is not petty like us but Jesus is willing to give us a holy reset every day you wake up reset every moment of your life reset every setup is a reset and if you have enough courage enjoy the reset I can't tell you when we're going to get back in here but reset I can't tell you when you're going to find another job but reset and if you're in the middle of your process get ready for a reset reset your finances reset your family reset your spirit reset your mind reset your body reset your home reset your church God is going to give us a reset and it's made possible because Jesus Christ beloved there might be somebody who's watching who is in need of a reset who is in need of divine restoration we offer Christ to you now. We pray that you would pray this prayer. Christ, I am a sinner. I'm one who is in need of a reset. Wanting to relish in my process and get help where I can get it. I trust in you. I believe in you and desire you. Beloved, if you've prayed that prayer, you are saved. I want to leave us all with a prayer. God, we come now asking you to give us reset that you would restart us on a path to give us more power and more zeal. We don't know what the end is going to be. We don't know when everything will go back to a sense of relief and normalcy. But God, we desire a reset. But not just for pandemic, oh God, I pray that you would reset people's hearts and minds and souls. God, I pray for every heart that has been broken and damaged, that you'd reset. For every person who's been burnt out through the midst of this pandemic, reset it, oh God. Every family that's at its wit's end, reset them, oh Lord. Reset us, oh Lord, that we might do what you've called us to do and be who you've called us to be. We thank you for the master's name of Jesus that makes our resetting every day and every moment possible. Thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy, your love and your kindness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we ask that you would prepare your elements for our communion experience. It was the Thursday before the Friday that our Lord and Master instituted the supper. He took bread, broke it, and blessed it, and likewise he did the cup, saying, as often as we do this, we show forth his death and his suffering. We counted again another moment of reset to be around the Lord's table once again. For that we say thank you.
So we do as Christ commands and we remember him, Re- remember his suffering, remember his pain, remember his isolation. And as you go through life's journey, remember that there is a Christ who says he would never leave you nor forsake you. Let us pray over our elements. God, we ask that you would bless it. We remember what you did on Calvary's cross. And for that, we say thank you. But God, we also come acknowledging our corruptible nature. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would forgive us for our sins. Sins that we know about and sins that we do not know we've committed. Forgive us and continue to put us in the process of being in alignment with you. This we ask in the mighty and precious name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Beloved, this is the bread representing the broken body of our Lord and Master. Let us remember Jesus as we eat together. This is the cup representing the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. Let us continue to commit to the life and the way of Jesus Christ as we commune together. Amen. Beloved, always remember that God loves you, so do I, and we will see you soon. 